for our next presentation, uh, we are very delighted to invite Dr. Thomas. Uh, this is the uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry 1989 on his uh, work on discovery of catalytic properties of RNA. Can you hear us? We can see your slides and we can Hello. see you. Hello, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Well, welcome students. Um, I was going to start by saying that I wish I were there in uh, Cambridge, but I now see at least on my screen that it looks like I am there with King's College in the background. Um, so uh, my, my story today is going to be about ribonucleic acid, RNA. And I am going to try to convince you that the 21st century is the age of RNA. Now, I don't want to explain this just to science students, but also to the non-scientist general public. And that can be very challenging because although people are generally comfortable with DNA, they understand that it uh, is responsible for our inheritance, uh, they can use it to trace family history or to understand genetic diseases that might be running in a family or to solve crimes. When it comes to uh, DNA's daughter molecule, RNA, many people say, um, you know, that's too complicated for me to understand. But the truth is that it is chemically, RNA, very similar to its parent, DNA, and in fact, it carries the same information, except in a single strand. And so uh, the order of A's, G's, C's, and T's on one strand of the DNA is then copied into the same order of A's, G's, C's, and U's, U being only a slight chemical variant of T in DNA, but it has the same coding capacity. Now, uh, at least by now, most people have heard about mRNA, messenger RNA, and that's because of the uh, mRNA vaccines that were used to vaccinate against SARS-CoV-2. And here you can see uh, this is roughly to scale that remarkably the lipid nanoparticles that were used to deliver the mRNA vaccines are about the same size as the SARS-CoV-2 virus itself. And similarly, they have a, a lipid-rich outer layer. And then the RNA, uh, shown here in red, is on the inside of the particle. So this is uh, the SARS virus is an example of the magic of RNA because uh, many viruses, not just the SARS virus, but also Ebola virus, the common flu virus, uh, they don't even use DNA at all. They store all of their information in ribonucleic acid. So uh, one of the reasons that these mRNA vaccines were uh, disconcerting to many of the citizens, many of our neighbors uh, who are not scientists, is that many magazine articles, social media, talked about mRNA as a medicine, mRNA as a drug. But of course, it's important to explain that mRNA is natural. It's in every cell in our body and it's in all of the food that we eat. It is essential for life. So uh, it is really not um, uh, useful to characterize it as a medicine. So we've known, in fact, for 60 years, uh, how this RNA works, this messenger RNA. And that is that the uh, orders of, order of bits of information, the A, G, C, and T in the DNA is copied into RNA. And then groups of three of these fundamental units, so-called nucleotides in the mRNA are used to specify a single amino acid and therefore in, in the protein product and therefore the uh, mRNA can be read out and uh, each group of three um, 
nucleotide specifying a single amino acid along the protein chain. And of course, proteins are the end result of this information transfer. They are responsible for digesting the food in our stomach, the enzymes uh, like pepsin. They are responsible for making our muscles move and our heart beat and our brains transmit signals. Now, to make a vaccine, uh, one needs to present to the human immune system a component of the virus that would be the first thing that the immune system would see if there were a viral infection. And this is the spike protein, which decorates the outside of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, now, one could make this protein uh, by starting with DNA and uh, having that be copied into mRNA and then translated into protein. But what the clever scientists at uh, BioNTech in Mainz, Germany, and in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts at Moderna realized was that they could take a shortcut and just uh, inject the mRNA in a stabilized form uh, for the vaccination shot, and then let the human body make the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And this gives a very uh, attractive amplification because each mRNA can be used hundreds of times to make hundreds of spike proteins before uh, it is naturally uh, eliminated from the body because mRNA, unlike DNA, uh, does not have a really long lifetime. Now, of course, the people point out that these uh, COVID-19 mRNA vaccines, uh, some people say they really weren't that great. Well, they did save an estimated 15 to 20 million deaths worldwide. So it's a bit unfair to focus on the fact that they were not perfect. But we admit they were not perfect. They uh, protected against hospitalization and death pretty well, but not, unfortunately, against reinfection. Uh, the virus also continues to mutate. Uh, that's still happening today, and that leads to variants of the virus uh, that are less um, protected, but for, uh, that we are less protected from uh, from the vaccination. Of course, the one of the beauties of the mRNA vaccine is that it can be quickly retooled to uh, respond to a mutated new form of the virus. And uh, it was disappointing that the vaccine had to be stored at ultra cold temperatures because this made it uh, difficult to disseminate, especially to countries that lack uh, a cold, what's called a cold chain uh, for uh, storing and delivering the vaccine. But nonetheless, we should point out that there are major advantages of these mRNA vaccines. They're very adaptable, as I just uh, mentioned, and also they're so quick to um, produce uh, compared to the traditional way of making antiviral vaccines, which is to hand inject chicken eggs with a debilitated vaccine strain of the virus. And so we can save about a million chicken eggs per year in my country alone, uh, and even more around the world by using instead of uh, uh, eggs as a little incubator to produce the vaccine to use the uh, mRNA. Now, it's still too early to tell if these mRNA vaccines are going to be uh, a complete new chapter in medicine. This is possible, but it is premature to claim that. Uh, and so what will the future hold? I think hopefully mRNA will provide more effective flu vaccines. Uh, what the problem with flu vaccine is that uh, because of this injection into the chicken eggs, we have to start making the vaccine before we know what strain is going to be prevalent in the next flu season. And the quicker production time of the mRNA vaccines could allow us to uh, be more precise in that prediction. Uh, personalized cancer vaccines are in clinical trials, and they look very promising against melanoma and there's no reason to think that they will be restricted to that particular type of cancer. 
Uh, the big unknown is therapeutic mRNA to replace proteins that are mutated in genetic diseases. Many people are skeptical about this. They think it will be difficult for mRNA to produce enough of a therapeutic protein to be uh, useful. Uh, but I think this will depend on which genetic disease we're trying to uh, target. And certainly there's enough uh, promise in this area that uh, many scientists and many companies are working to surmount these challenges. So uh, at this point, uh, maybe we could proclaim that the 21st century is the age of RNA. But wait a minute, I have some time left and I haven't really started much to tell you about the wonders of ribonucleic acid. Because beyond being a messenger RNA, there are many non-coding RNAs in all living systems, including the human body, that uh, don't even care about the triplet codons that specify a particular amino acid in a protein. They work as RNA molecules without encoding a protein. And there are uh, many examples of this, uh, very exciting stories that we could talk about, but I, because of the amount of time that I have, I am going to just focus on three of these. One is that RNA can be a biocatalyst. We call these ribosomes. RNA can bestow immortality. Wow, that sounds really special, but I need to say this is immortality at the cellular level, not for the whole human organism. And this is the RNA-driven machine called telomerase. And finally, RNA can guide the editing of genome by the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, system. So let's start out with the fact that RNA can be a catalyst. And this is a personal story. When I moved from MIT to Boulder, Colorado to start my first independent position, I started working on pond scum. Now, why would one choose pond scum as a uh, way of getting an experimental organism? Well, it wasn't just any old pond scum. It was this uh, little eukaryotic uh, cell, um, single-celled organism called Tetrahymena thermophila. And it had been shown by Joe Gall and by uh, Yen Engberg that there were uh, 10,000 copies of a particular gene in the large macro nucleus of this unicellular eukaryote. The reason uh, that the cell needed so many copies of a gene is because uh, the ribosomal RNA that was the product of this gene uh, was needed to make a lot of ribosomes to make a lot of proteins because this huge eukaryotic cell divides every three hours or so, and so it needs to double its protein content in that amount of time. Now, if you're a biochemist uh, like I am, um, having a lot of material to work with is a real advantage. And so instead of there being just two copies, as there would be in most of your diploid cells in your body of, of genes, one inherited from mom and one from dad, here we have 10,000, and that seemed like an enormous advantage. Now, one thing that we found rather early on was that this gene had its functional DNA sequences interrupted by an intron. These are very common in the genes of uh, eukaryotic organisms that have a separate nucleus and a cytoplasm. In fact, a typical human gene has 90% uh, of its length is in introns uh, and only 10% in uh, the functional coding sequences. Uh, so uh, what is known about these introns is that they are copied into the RNA by RNA polymerase in the process that we call transcription. And then 
Uh, this necessitates a step in the expression of this gene called RNA splicing, by which this intron is clipped out and the flanking functional sequences are uh, stitched together. And when we found this intron in the tetrahymena gene, there was uh, maybe 100 genes that had been found to have introns or in laboratories around the world, but everyone was uh, knew that they existed, but was interested in the mechanism of the RNA splicing. How are these introns removed? And we thought that by having this system that amplified this process so much, maybe we could make a contribution in that area. And what we set out to do was to find the enzymes, the proteins that were responsible for this RNA splicing. Because, of course, any reaction that takes place with this sort of uh, speed and accuracy, only two sites along this large RNA being chosen for splicing, must be catalyzed by an enzyme. And uh, everyone knew from reading textbooks that all enzymes are proteins, right? And so in the initial experiment to look for the splicing enzymes, we took unspliced RNA, and the wiggly line represents the intron that needs to be spliced out, and we added to this an extract from the tetrahymena nuclei because we knew that splicing took place in the nucleus. And would you believe it? The first time we tried this experiment, it worked. We were able to recapitulate RNA splicing as shown by gel electrophoresis. And so the um, RNA uh, with, with the incubated with the nuclear extract released its intron, but there was a problem. We did a control experiment where we left out the nuclear extract, the source of the splicing enzyme, and just as much splicing took place without the nuclear extract as with the nuclear extract. Well, this seemed impossible that the RNA splicing didn't require the extract of nuclei. And so we spent a couple of years pondering the possibility and testing the possibility that our reactions were contaminated with some source of the tetrahymena nuclei that would provide this enzyme. We finally used recombinant DNA technology to make a um, RNA precursor that had never been exposed to the tetrahymena cell. And when that RNA underwent splicing in the test tube, we were willing to declare uh, the answer to the following uh, puzzle that had been um, that had been uh, bothering us for so long was was there a protein? Uh, involved in this or not. And uh, so this is my student, Paula Grabowski, gave me this little daisy as a Christmas present, and we were able to uh, do something more scientific than picking off the petals of the daisy. And we were able to conclude that um, and, and announce that the RNA by itself was providing the catalytic power for the splicing reaction. So this was of interest to a whole nother community of researchers that we hadn't even understood were, were considering these possibilities. And these are not the people who are studying Campbell's primordial soup, but rather the events that took place on the primitive earth of almost 4 billion years ago when the first self-reproducing system arose from presumably random chemical uh, events. And they had been stuck in what is sometimes called the uh, most fundamental chicken and egg problem, which came first, the informational molecule or the functional catalyst that could copy that informational molecule. Seems daunting to require that there be, for example, a DNA molecule and a protein that could um, replicate it and copy it into daughter molecules, both uh, being produced by random chemical reactions uh, in the same droplet of water at the same time. But now that we know that RNA both carries information, as I've talked about it being 
uh, an informational molecule, but also is an active uh, catalyst. Maybe the RNA is both the photocopying machine and the molecule being copied. So at the beginning, there might have been an RNA world, and then only proteins came later, and much more recently, DNA uh, has been established as a more stable storehouse of genetic information. So this is now a very uh, popular hypothesis, especially uh, John Sutherland there in Cambridge, UK, uh, is one of the leaders in um, recapitulating this RNA world in the laboratory, uh, but it's still difficult to prove uh, that this historically was the way that uh, life started on our planet. In any case, this led to a wonderful event, which was uh, my being awarded the 1989 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, along with Sidney Altman of Yale University, who made uh, independent discoveries of RNA catalysis. And here I am dancing in Stockholm uh, with my daughter. My younger daughter uh, was still a baby and they did not think she could uh, come to the ceremony. So we had to get a babysitter for her. Now let's move on to another role of non-coding RNA. And this is the fact that RNA can bestow immortality. So this is the telomerase story. And in order to introduce this, I have to say just a word about the ends of our chromosomes, where the double helix of DNA ends. There is a special sequence here lit up by a fluorescent probe that binds to this uh, special sequence. And this was first discovered by Liz Blackburn in Joe Gall's laboratory, these repeated DNA sequences at the ends of chromosomes. And these are a vulnerable part of the chromosome and they need protection, sort of like the plastic tips called aglets protect the ends of our shoelaces. Now, if, they're, if they are not, if the telomeric DNA is not uh, maintained, or replicated, it shrinks as cells divide. And this turns out to be very useful because when the telomere gets critically short, then the cells are signaled to stop dividing. This is called the Hayflick limit after Leonard Hayflick, uh, who first described this phenomenon in human body cells. So what about cells, though, that need to keep dividing? Well, uh, these are include, for example, stem cells uh, that, that have to be continued to divide to replace uh, worn out cells and tissues in the body. Uh, how do they continue to divide and avoid stopping at the Hayflick lim limit? It turns out that a molecular machine called telomerase solves this problem and allows stem cells to continue dividing. And what does telomerase look like? Well, here in this cartoon, we see that it has an RNA component shown as the purple ribbon. This is an essential part of the enzyme. Unusual, right, for an enzyme to be to require RNA, but I just told you about the tetrahymena ribozyme, so you should be a bit prepared for this. And here the RNA, among other uh, roles, is providing the template for the nucleotides to be uh, brought in and uh, to be extended on the end, the DNA nucleotides, on the end of the chromosome, which you can see here as this uh, light blue or gray strand. Now, this RNA is not capable of doing the whole reaction by itself. It's not a ribosome. And so it requires a uh, protein component called telomerase reverse transcriptase. It's a reverse transcriptase because it's going in the reverse direction. It's copying RNA into DNA instead of DNA into RNA. And the RNA subunit was discovered by um, Liz Blackburn and Carol Greider, who also got the Nobel Prize for their discovery of telomerase. And the telomerase reverse transcriptase 
protein subunit was discovered by Joachim Lingner, a Swiss postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory in, in Boulder. So the combination of this protein and this RNA allows cells to proliferate continuously. It gives them immortality. Now that sounds like a really good thing. And a lot of people uh, think that it's such a good thing that they go online and they buy these different uh, bottles of pills that they think will uh, lengthen their telomeres uh, through activation of telomerase. But I would not particularly recommend this. First of all, one has to understand that the Food and Drug Administration has not approved these as pharmaceutical agents because they are uh, considered food supplements, so they have not been through clinical trials. But in addition to that, if they really did work, it might, for some people, not be good news because cancer cells are another example of a cell type that uses telomerase activation to gain immortality. And how the telomerase was turned on in cancer was a mystery for about 10 years. And uh, Levi Garraway and his uh, Harvard Med Medical School uh, med fellow, Franklin Wong, uh, figured out one of the answers in 2013 that a mutation in the TERT gene, the gene we had discovered, the telomerase reverse transcriptase gene, was uh, driving the upregulation of telomerase in many, but not all, kinds of cancer. But it's still pretty remarkable how this oncogene works. 80% of all melanoma tumors, that's 400,000 tumors around the world each year, have independently got this mutation in the regulatory region of the TERT gene that allows these melanoma tumors to be um, immortal. Similarly, the deadly brain disease, glioblastoma, is largely explained by this TERT promoter mutation, bladder cancer and liver cancer, somewhat lower levels. Interestingly, it's absent in other common cancers, such as breast and colon cancer. They still need to reactivate telomerase reverse transcriptase in order to gain immortality, but they do it through epigenetic rather than mutational uh, process. Now, last story, and I will make this one quick because of my time constraint, is that RNA is essential to this fascinating uh, gene editing process called CRISPR, which I'm sure you've heard about. Um, what is genome editing like? Well, if we were to think about the human genome sequence as a text file, depending on the font, font size, it would take about a million pages to write out the haploid genome of the human. And what this CRISPR genome editing is able to do is to, just like a search function on your computer, it's able to find a particular sentence that has a mistake in it, shown here the red letter U, and edit that, uh, so it's like a search and replace function, it can edit that mistake and make it correct again, change the red U to a red A. So considering how many genetic diseases in humans have identified nucleotide mutations that give a mutant amino acid in the protein, this is pretty uh, exciting. And it led to the Nobel Prize in 2020 to Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna. And in Boulder, we were particularly excited uh, by Jennifer's prize because she had been a postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory. And here she is at a Czech lab reunion in 2007, uh, pictured with uh, several other uh, former graduates of the department that have become professors at the University of Chicago, the University of Washington, and the Scripps Institute in California. So how does CRISPR work? Well, 
it cuts DNA in a specific spot, but it's not as simple as the red scissors. Instead, it uses a guide RNA, which is associated with the protein that actually does the cleavage. And only when this guide RNA, about 20 nucleotides long, matches the complementary sequence on a part of the human genome, just like that word editing program, search and replace, does it lock down and uh, cut the DNA at that spot. And then the repair machinery from the human cells goes to work and it can either uh, restitch the break or it can insert new information in this break. And this is the way that you can uh, repair uh, genetic defects. So this technology has been credited with the unthinkable power to control evolution, the awesome prospect of editing humanity, the chance to direct the future of the human race, which sounds a little frightening, right? It sounds like um, maybe this is sort of like uh, the atomic bomb that it can do Nuclear energy can do good things, but it can also be misused. So the question has come up, uh, should we ban certain uses of CRISPR? And scientists are still uh, speaking to politicians and to the general public about these issues. I hope they are speaking to them uh, as often as they can. And I would encourage you, if you become a scientist, to engage with the public as often as possible. Well. Our conclusions, at least for now, are that if this genome editing can be used to reduce pain and suffering, we really have to go ahead and use it if it is safe and effective. And uh, this, in fact, has already happened. The first CRISPR therapy for sickle cell disease was approved just a few months ago, both in the UK and in the United States. And more CRISPR therapies are certainly going to come. But if it can be used for enhancements, like to make people uh, an Olympic athlete, this is the week of the Olympics, uh, give you better muscles or uh, be taller or stronger, uh, we think that is one foot in the door for eugenics and is not an appropriate use. Uh, germline editing for inherited changes might be something that could be considered in the future, but right now we think uh, it is not responsible to edit the germline. And uh, another uh, question that we struggle with is what if the advantages of such a technology will be available, which is certainly going to be true initially, only in a few countries, only available to the rich, um, then this is a societal issue which needs to be thought about. And how about CRISPR edited plants and animals being released into the environment? could be a really good thing uh, for global warming to be able to make crop plants that are drought resistant and heat resistant, uh, perhaps livestock that produce less of methane uh, when they burp, which is a, um, a greenhouse gas. Uh, but again, we have to be careful about releasing genetically modified organisms in the environment. So uh, right now um, we have to be uh, cautious about uh, those ethic, ethical questions, but at the same time, there's so much medical potential in this technology, and particularly for repairing faulty genes, because most genes are genetic or have a genetic component, and often the cause is clear, but in the past, we've had no way to fix it, and now we do. So I've talked about, uh, in closing, I would just say that I've talked about three types of non-coding RNA, which in combination with the wonders of messenger RNA, lead me to proclaim that the 21st century is the age of RNA. DNA is old stuff. It's old hat. We understand it. The future lies in ribonucleic acid. And I have talked about this uh, in much more detail in my uh, book that just came out uh, uh, about a month ago called The Catalyst, published by W.W. W. Norton. And this, again, is my effort 
to explain the wonders of RNA, not just to bright students such as yourselves, but also to non-scientists and to the general public who I think would be excited to hear about um, what RNA is capable of doing. And with that, I would like to um, say thank you, and I would be glad to uh, listen to any of your questions and try to respond. Thank you so much, Dr. Thomas. Uh, I'm here with a hard copy of your book, so I'll leave it on for the students to have a look at. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you again for your lecture. I'll open the floor for uh, questions, okay? Uh, any questions, please? I, I can see a couple of hands. I'll go with the first one. Uh, please, please. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for your talk. Um, I was wondering if introns play any special role in genes. I, I, I heard the thank you for your talk part, but I didn't hear the question. Uh, I was wondering if introns play any role in genes. If, if what plays any role in genes? Introns. Introns. Yes. V thank you for that question. This is a, a wonderful uh, uh, area of science right now, because although introns uh, perhaps initially were just uh, obnoxious interruptions in a gene that had to be um, removed, at least in the human cell nucleus, there is much alternative RNA splicing. So sometimes you, you have splicing from point A to point B, but sometimes it goes from point A to point C or from B to C. And therefore, uh, the human genome is able to produce multiple messenger RNAs from a single gene and therefore make multiple proteins. And we think this is one way that you get more um, power from a limited genome is by utilizing these introns to do alternative splicing and get multiple proteins from a single gene. So thank you for that question. Thank you again, Professor. I'll go for the second question. Hello, and uh, thank you very much for the talk. My question was, how do you think uh, DNA emerged from the primordial soup following RNA? So um, DNA, uh, those of us in the RNA research community consider DNA just to be another modified form of RNA, right? And how can I make such a bold statement that RNA was around for a long time and DNA is a more recent invention? It's because if you look at the biosynthetic pathway of DNA, it simply uses all of the steps that are used to make RNA. And then it adds just two enzymes at the end. One that makes the ribose sugar into deoxyribose. And then another one that adds the methyl group to uracil to make thymine. And so it, it really provides a strong argument that RNA is the, is the key nucleic acid molecule, and then at some point, some lucky cell uh, developed a ribonucleotide reductase and, and was able to convert RNA into DNA, and whoa, all of a sudden the, the genetic information is much more stable, so we can have a bigger genome, and this has an enormous selective advantage, and so then DNA takes over as the genetic information except in many viruses where uh, you don't need a big genome. Viruses have small genomes, and so RNA uh, is maintained as the genome. We have one more question in the live audience. Uh, hi, thank you for your speech. I have a bit of a more technical uh, question. Do you have any advice for using random hexamal primers uh, if you've had any experience with them? Yes, we do use them. Um, it, they, uh, you know, the advantage is that you are able to get PCR uh, polymerase chain reaction to work without a lot of knowledge of the exact sequence of what you are trying to amplify. But if possible, it is much more efficient to use a gene-specific primer 
that, it, that pairs precisely to the gene of interest. And we've just been doing this, in fact, with, um, we have a collaboration with a colleague here at Colorado who works on honeybees, and I have a undergraduate in my laboratory who's writing his senior honors thesis, and he just uh, has been amplifying a honeybee um, messenger RNA, and he's used both the, the random hexamers and the gene-specific primer, and the gene-specific primer worked a lot better. Uh, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? We have one more question. We want you to ask both. Hi, Professor. Thank you so Hello. much. Hello. Yeah, I'm not a science student right now, but I did science like back in middle school, and I still understood all your content really well. So I think you did a great job of explaining things. I think my question is somewhat along those lines because. I know that just like you mentioned, you wrote a book that's more geared towards the public. So how do you think that other academics, maybe beyond science even in things like social sciences, things like that, can make the sort of niche academic um, knowledge or what they have found more accessible to the public in areas um, or methods other than like, let's say what you've already done, which is publishing a book. Thank you for that question. I really appreciate it. Um, I think one, essential feature is to avoid jargon. Jargon is the technical language that is so useful for us in the laboratory, right? I can walk into my lab and say, um, maybe we should just crisper that allele into the endogenous locus in HEC 293 T cells. And my student immediately knows what that means. But it would take me three days to explain that to a non-scientist. So jargon is not intrinsically a bad thing, but it has its place in the laboratory and we need to avoid it when we're trying to explain our work to a broad non-scientific public. And I think we need to teach our science students how to do this too. I think we need to give them a course in public communication, and we're doing this now in Colorado with our graduates. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll leave another copy of the book to have a look. Do you have any more questions in the office? Uh, meanwhile, I can have a quick question. Uh, uh, Professor, here we have a lot of ink students who are starting college, uh, looking to apply for college. Do you have any advice for them at this moment? So for... Um, science students, but also for students in uh, mathematics, engineering, uh, and uh, social sciences, um, and even students who are interested in the arts and in music. I think that what you need to do is to find a way to get an active component of your college education not just sitting in a lecture hall and listening to talks like the one I just gave, ha ha ha, but also, uh, you know, doing something yourself. And so the, the best education that we provide for our undergraduates is to get them into a research laboratory, give them a project and let them try to uh, work, work through it um, using state of the art equipment and giving them mentorship, but um, giving them the uh, freedom to both fail and succeed uh, by taking ownership of a research project. And so I would encourage all of you who go to, most universities have such opportunities, but usually you have to be persistent and ask many professors before you find a laboratory that has room for an extra student. So I would encourage you to try to do that college because it is really uh, a transformative experience for those students who can achieve it. Thank you so much. It happens to be that we have a batch of very good students who just presented excellent research with low results. I'm sure that they'll do great in college, but thanks again for your advice. Any last questions? Excellent. We have one more, we have one more question if that's okay with you. 
Sure. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Sorry, one more question. Uh, so with the RNAs that could sort of self-replicate, uh, why did the kind of more conventional, in general, RNA replication evolve if it was kind of built in? Yes. So, so um, what, what we found um, after we found the self-splicing RNA was that if we remove the intron from the RNA that it was uh, sitting in the middle of, uh, then it could act as an enzyme and work on other RNA molecules, which is essential if RNA is going to be a replicase. And then a number of other researchers, uh, including Jennifer Doudna, uh, when she was a graduate student in Jack Shostak's laboratory, and another Shostak um, trainee, Dave Bartel, who's now at MIT, uh, worked to improve the RNA replication abilities of these ribosomes. And so uh, we've been able, the community of, of RNA researchers has been able to show that RNA uh, can be a quite a good catalyst of RNA replication, uh, at least under controlled laboratory conditions, thereby lending some support to the idea that maybe this is the way that it happened on the primordial Earth. Thank you. Thank you for the I think we have some more work for someone that could ask any questions. Or I can go for one question on their behalf, which I think is some of them are uh, dribbling between choice of subjects, especially uh, biology slash engineering for their college courses and modules. Do, do you have any advice on people on selection of courses or subjects? Yes, um, I, I would learn how to code. And maybe you all know how to code already, but um, biology, Chemistry, physics, our engineering are becoming much more computationally driven, right? We've seen this in the protein folding arena with AlphaFold, now AlphaFold 3, using AI. Uh, instead of experiments in the lab, we can use the computer and AI to look at folded protein structures. Uh, Currently, they're, they're not, these programs are pretty good, but they're not perfect. So we still go back into the laboratory to test the ideas that come from the computation. But clearly in the future, the computer is going to be the, the queen of this field. And I would encourage all of you to take courses in computer science, as well as uh, whatever discipline you are planning to major in. Thank you so much, Professor, again, uh, the lead of your talk, and thanks for your time. And best wishes to all of you in your future studies and in your future careers.